Hey, hey, guess what, James? It's time. What is it? It's time. All right, shall we do the countdown? Yes, let's start. All right, 10, nine, nine eight, eight, seven, seven six, six, five, four, four three, three, two, two one, one, zero. PowerPoint, don't crash on me. Yay, Kelsey's here. Yes, Cheryl. Hi, my name is Earl. Did you wake up one morning and find your home infested with megafauna from the late Carboniferous and early Permian periods? And Hi, my name is Earl. Did you wake up one morning and find your home infested with megafauna from the late Carboniferous and early Permian periods, an era of six foot centipedes, two foot spiders, and two and a half foot dragonflies, and Vespa mandarinia, otherwise known as the murder hornet. If so, call big ass megafauna exterminators. When we arrive, bugs are out of time because we kill bugs that are out of time. We kill bugs that lived 300 million years ago but shouldn't be alive today. For one low exorbitant price, we'll install a panic room in your home with a hallway leading to the panic room full of a gauntlet of two megawatt bug zappers. When you activate your panic room, we'll respond to the call for another low exorbitant price with a C-130 carrying a GBU-43B Massive Ordnance Air Blast, otherwise known as MOAB, the mother of all bombs to take out any of those prehistoric pests with the largest non-nuclear explosion in the history of the human race. We then move in with our ground forces armed with such incendiary devices as bazookas and flamethrowers to take out any pesty stragglers that somehow incalculably survived our initial onslaught air attack. You may not have a home when we're done because it's now a big crater, but you won't have any big bugs like murder hornets. Big ass megafauna exterminators also specializes in ridding your home of early, other early Permian pests such as Arthroplora, Palmonoscorpius coctinosis, Magarachi, and Meganura. Remember, if you wake up and find your home infested with pests from out of time, then you're out of time and it's time to call big ass megafauna exterminators. And remember, we also kill murder hornets. Welcome to Late Night Craft Talk with hosts of Aya Kamori Yang and James Hermes. Special guest, Cynthia Masterson from blue.beadwork.com. It's 10 p.m. on Friday. You have two choices. You can either eat that last slice of cheesecake or watch our show. Well, you've got the best of both worlds. You can eat that cheesecake and watch our show. Now it's time to start the show. Let me tell you, we test run, we test run, and we test run. And as soon as we go live, then we have a two to three second lag on the video. Of course. Of course. It doesn't matter <laughs> so. how much you practice, it's always going to be like that. Oh, no, we run it, we run it. And as soon as Friday night hits a 10, think Murphy's Law's got to go high. So it's just like, yeah, but it's all cool. Yeah, that's just how it is. Yes. Murder hornets. Okay. All <laughs> right. This has been fun. Uh, all right. So we have winners. Oh liked how articulate Earl was this week because some of those words were pretty scientific. I had to work with Earl on saying on how to pronounce those a lot. Yes. And you know, everything on there was correct. Really except for the one thing that wasn't. Go ahead, folks. Fact check me. Learn something about archaeology. <laughs> yeah, right? Okay. And prehistory. Anyway. Oh. So, so we got winners for last week's we're trivia. Okay, we have three prizes. So for the, those of you who are watching our show now, what we do every week, we have trivia questions 
and we have you guys email in your answers and then we put your your names into this cup we have a whole bunch of names this week and what happens is we draw the prizes every the following week and those people are winners and um, what happens is we have a whole bunch of really cool items from elk rack traders and from dancing bear indian trader and then our guests always offer something up and say hey i'm going to give something away for free too so Savia, 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 Savia. Okay, last week you told me you put everybody was in the drawing in the cup. Now you tell me their names. And I looked at the cup and all was in there was pieces of paper. Can you show me what's in there? There's lots of people in here. There's lots of people. There's Yo, people witchcraft is mysticizing and quite frightens me very much. <laughs> so anyway, so if you watch our show, you can win something. And I know that a lot of our viewers they won something, so they love watching our show because not only are they entertained on a boring Friday night and they're laughing at us because we're silly and then they win stuff. So it's a win-win, right? Win, 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 win. Yeah, winning and winning and winning. Always and winning. a win. Okay, win. all right. So for the winner, okay, so James, what was your yes, prize that you're giving the away? Prize this, the prize for this, the winners of this week's trivia questions is are going to get a small obsidian knife. Okay, cool. There's an allowance last week because I had to watch a rerun and go, yeah, I said that. The winner from ours is going to win a floral scarf and they can pick if they want whatever color or they want metallic so this is standard. So they get to win one of those. And then our our guest from last week, Maricela, she actually was giving away a pair of beautiful dentilium earrings with Cheyenne pink beads. So I was like, I wish I could win. I wish I could put my name in because all our all our viewers get the coolest prizes. And I'm like, I want to put my name in. Yep. So let's see what happens. Let's pull we got, we got, we got, we got, we got James, 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 James. Okay. All right. So are you I ready? I the answers. Okay. All right. So the first winner for Elk Rack Traders is Sarah. Sarah won. Yay. All right, Sarah. Awesome. Well, I'll be in contact with you to get your con your shipping information. Yes. Okay. And the winner for a floral scarf from Dancing Bear Trader, Indian Trader. Is Dan, 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 Dan. James. Wait, James. Yes. Okay. I'm going to draw another one because you're not supposed to put your name in here. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> it was a conspiracy. <laughs> okay. Next. This 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 viewer is so lucky because his viewers won before. Kelsey, she really Kelsey won. Kelsey, my gosh, she won. You won a full star from us. Oh my gosh. Okay. And the winner from Maricela's earrings. Vivian. Vivian as well. She's super lucky. She won. Dentillium earrings from Marcella. So, yay! Congratulations, winners! All right. Okay. So, James, what have you been yes. doing this week? Um, this week, I've been working a lot of the kits that I've been talking about, um, getting them ready. Uh, mainly, the one is focusing on is the arrow kits I've been making because I get them and I thought, you know, I can make this and make this. They're going to be about twelve dollars each, um, but I was talking making this one and what I actually started kind of changed them around to make them cooler by was adding hide glue. So I've been making hide glue, which kind of stinks. It was boiling a lot of boiling a lot of water to make it, but you want to make them as cool as authentic as possible. And so just work on the kits. We're gonna have five kits to be hitting over the next couple of weeks. I've already been getting orders for them, but um, you know, uh flat fringe wrap medicine wheels, arrow kits, feather fan kits, uh and the uh you know, leather wrapped feathers because I've been airbrushing feathers for that. Um, really enjoying it. It's missing power season, but doing that work that involves what kind of power season was really having kits in a while. It's nice. It's really cool. Huh? And so, Savea, how you doing, Dancing Bear? We've been very busy this week. We actually are reformatting our store and we are actually moving things around so that we can make wider aisles. Um, and prepare a store for um, the shipping that we do. So Are you that doing flowers now? 
Oh yeah, I'm in California right now. I just thought the density bear is going to become floral. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I love poppies, by the way. Those are poppies in the background. They're beautiful flowers. Uh, so uh, what happened is um, we, since we've been closed since the quarantine, we are just, um, we've just been so busy with shipping and uh, phone orders, curbside pickup, that it really affected how our store layout is. And plus, when we do open, we want to have wider aisles so that people are not, they're, they're able to space out a bit. And um, we're going to be opening soon for appointment only. Um, shopping at our store. So um, we're getting ready for that right now. So. so somebody wants to make an appointment for Dancing Bear. Do they make the appointment and you wait six weeks? <laughs> Sorry. I, somebody's going to make that joke and you're kind of like, James, but I'm like, I think it's funny. Come into our store. There's going to be a big old wait list. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as efficient as your staff is, that's not a long wait. I got to clarify that because I was making a doctor office joke. Okay. All right, so shall we move on? Oh, wait, really quick. For those who are watching our show, you guys haven't know, you don't know about our show history. Basically, yes. um, um, our show, um, James and I, we both um, have two businesses, um, Dancing Bear Indian Trader and Elk Rock Trader and Traders. And what we're doing is we're creating these really fun shows where, for one thing, we're friends, believe it or not. <laughs> We'd like fight each other, but- um, I answered a Craigslist ad. <laughs> and uh, we want to basically create some fun opportunities for people to uh, network. And so we've found different artists and friends and small business owners and designers and small business, I mean, just amazing people that we want to inspire everyone who's crafters, artists, everything. So, I mean, this world is so small and we want to help promote each other. And when we do the show, it basically helps people keep in touch with Dancing Bear and Elk Rack Traders. And then also we can bring in some really great people so that because we know so many people, <laughs> it, oh, yeah. it kind of get some of these people in and um, talk to them and get a chance for them to talk to others. And we do have quick Q and A's and we have trivia and we have fun and we do fun little segments. So um, we do this all for your entertainment, for the three people that watch us. <laughs> Plus times 10 plus 1,000, like my math better. What's neat is about the guests we have from week to week is that we have great beaters. Uh, future guests are gonna include, you know, flute makers, flute players, power singers, um, some others. I'm kind of looking at the guest list just to kind of get a quick one. We've got some people to do lapidary coming up, uh, all great artists. And I also want to remind that we got, before we forget, because. Uh, that anybody that has their own craft work that they'd like to just to feature on the show, please send it to us because a lot of us have had some extra free time lately. Yeah. Uh, please send it to us and we will feature on the show. We'd like to show the, the pictures of your work that you brought in because we're sure it's awesome. Just remember to uh, to email your photo with your name, what it is, to latenightcrafttalk at gmail.com. That means you. Like when <laughs> and you. I blistered my blister finger, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm looking right there. Y'all right there, you got on the couch, you petting the cat, and you over there reading a the magazine instead of watching the show. Who send cares about picture, Time Magazine? Send us pictures of what you're doing because we're going to do an episode where we're going to put everyone's pictures together and we're going to talk about everyone's work and say well, who did it and kind of put like contact information for all that stuff. So it's yep. coming up in a couple episodes. So make sure to get all your you know, start submitting those so we can put those all in together and do a nice little segment show about all of our um, watchers and what they're working on during the quarantine and during the quarantine time. And um, anyway, that's fun. Okay, on to the next segment. Yes. Okay, yes. so for those of you that saw what we might do next week's segment, we went to Amboy, California to go look around, look for people to interview. Wasn't so successful. There's really not a lot of people in Amboy. People there, not like at all. Two point four people or something like that. And those ones, I don't know, they were hiding. But so we had late night craft talk on the road across America. And tonight we're doing it again. We're coming. We actually went to Amboy, California. This time we're virtually going to Seattle, Washington. Ah, and with that, I, shall I introduce so Seattle, Washington, Sadeo? I've never been there before, so I'm really excited. We're I'm virtually really there right now. All right, 
for everyone, and I'm making this off the top of my head as we go along, let me tell you about Seattle. Seattle, Washington is not the capital of Washington state, nor is it the nation's capital of Washington, DC. It is a, I believe the biggest city in Washington state in the Northwest part of our country, bordered on the South by Oregon, to the North by Canada, British Columbia, and to the West by, I believe Japan, and to the East by it's Wisconsin. like Mount Fuji right there. <laughs> and apparently part of Japan right there off the coast. Other <laughs> landmarks <laughs> of, other landmarks of Seattle, Washington, including the Washington Space Needle. At the top it happens to be a spaceship as revealed in the movie, uh, Men in Black, the first one, the funniest one. Seattle is also home to such technology companies as Microsoft, Amazon, and is also the scene that the place that invented grunge bands such as Pearl Jam and uh, what's the one that Kurt Cobain was in? Uh, Nirvana. Nirvana, thank you. Yes. My brain, my my blonde is showing. So whoopsie doodles. Anyway, with those areas that we have, uh, we have. And why is my slides out of order? Okay. Now we have uh, Seattle's also, I'm looking at my slides going, all right, funky things happening here. All right. Seattle is also the home to more coffee shops than there are people. So I believe it is about four coffee shops per one citizen of or resident of Seattle, Washington. So they really like their coffee and they have a lot of choices. And with Seattle, a lot of people like to talk about the weather. Well. We want to present the weather report by Savea, our person on the spot that's virtually in Seattle, to give us a weather report for Seattle. Oh, hold on. Whoops. Savea is smiling at me with a creepy smile. No, awesome smile. I misspoke. There's Savea. Okay. That's the weather, Savea. Here I am. I'm going to be giving the Seattle weather report right now. It is 57 degrees Fahrenheit, and the precipitation percentage is 12%. Humidity is 68%. The winds are at four miles per hour. So today we have a we have actually a little bit of a cooling trend for the weekend, but it's going to go back up during the week. So you know this would be a good weekend to like make sure to stay inside and read a book, and then maybe during the week you may want to go outside, but it looks like this weekend might be raining, so you're probably going to want to stay inside still because it's going to be raining. Maybe fireplace, uh, s'mores, you know, inside activities because I don't know. I mean, it's going to look like it's going to be raining on and off every other day for the next few days, so I well, think it's that Seattle. That's a good plan. 100 days of rain, you know, 100 days of sun a year, <laughs> which means there's like 500 days of rain. Where's yes. the rain? Yes, so it, it's going to be a very, a very mellow temperature here compared to California. Um, I think that uh, it, it's more like a sweater weather versus a tank top weather, like James um, in this area. It was 115 it, degrees where I lived a couple days ago. Clothes at all because it's so dang hot. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have rain. Okay, so we ready for our interview? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Let's. All right. So for everyone. Just a reminder that there is, come on, come on. There we go. Just a reminder everyone that there is a, there's three coffee shops for every one person in Seattle. So we had our pick of every coffee shop there is. We decide to have tonight's interview and the rest of our show in Quarantino's Coffee Shop and Restaurant, where we're going to, inter we're going to interview tonight's guest, Cynthia Masterson's from blue.beadwork.com. Okay. Hello, Cynthia. Okay, let me get this going for a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. If y'all notice, we have a nice coffee shop inside Quarantino's coffee shop. Great coffee, just watch out for the results shop. 30 seconds later. Hello, Cynthia. Hey. How, How you doing? Is this oh. What do you think of this coffee shop? Isn't it nice? Mmm, coffee smells delicious. It does. <laughs> I know it's such a good coffee shop. I keep feeling like I want to just drink coffee. I know and because it's a restaurant. Too. I can eat. I can eat food on the show. <laughs> I even have my coffee. big old coffee pot here, ready to pour some coffee <laughs> if I need it. 
Okay, so Cynthia, tell us about yourself. Well, hi everybody, um, I'm Cynthia Masterson. Um, I'm here in Seattle, Washington. I've lived half my life here and half my life in Oklahoma where I'm from. Um, I am an enrolled member of the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma. So I'm visiting uh, on Duwamish territory. And so traditionally here, a lot of the tribes will acknowledge where they are and we are here on Duwamish territory. And another thing they do to acknowledge an honor is they'll hold your hands up. So it's like, I hold my hands up to you. So uh, Chief Seattle for the city we're named after, I hold my hands up to you, so. Uh, what else? Okay, so yeah, I bead a lot. Um, and I teach beading, I do beading, I do craft parties, um, and I do, I'm an artist. So I do a lot of different things all revolving around beads. Yay, that's the kind of people we like here at our <laughs> store that sells beads. <laughs> Remember, I could eat on the show because we're in a restaurant. I'm getting away with this. No Cracker Jacks. <laughs> well, the prize aren't as cool as they used to be. That is not a plug or an advertisement in any way. I'm taking advantage, I'm taking advantage we're in a restaurant. I'm, it's all real. I usually think, I think that restaurants frown on people bringing in their own uh, food and beverages. I'm not going to eat this Quarantino stuff. You know what's going to happen 30 seconds later. <laughs> So, um, so Cynthia, how did you start getting into beadwork? Like what started you in that whole? Well, when I was little growing up in Oklahoma City, my mom was a teacher for an Indian ed program and they tried to teach beading or she, she tried to learn beading, but, but from her teacher program, she brought home a lot of beads and we had lots of little seed beads around and really about as far as we got was making daisy chains. Um, and then they kind of sat around for most of my life. And then I went to college um, and here at University of Washington and I had wanted to learn how to bead. And so, um, well, it's kind of a long circuitous story, but somebody back in Oklahoma and maybe you've seen them in your store, maybe you've sold them those how to bead videos. Um, Somebody, my, that guy went to my church and he gave me those videos and I, I never watched them, put them somewhere. I don't know, have to him. So then, then I go to University of Washington and I get them at the library. And so I watched the one, like how to do three drop. And I watched it on VHS. And uh, if you try to learn that stitch, it's like I had to watch it and then rewind and then yeah. watch it. And so that's kind of my inspiration to do, create a lot of the videos I have on my YouTube channel um, to teach and show how to do the stitch. And so when I'm teaching, um, this is, I don't know if you can, you can see it. This is what we do to start. We do the big beads and this is the little project. And so it looks really simple, but this takes probably about like over an hour to do yep. if you're just learning. And so I have that video on my website um, and then you can go look and find all the materials lists on my website too. Um, so, so yeah, where was I going with that? That's the teaching. That's well, how I got into it. Yes, we got reminded I got a late video to return to Blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, think I was, the I'll last one, the, show. the last one's in Bend, Oregon. So you'll have to go there to, to turn it in. <laughs> what? Am I that late on the video? You are. <laughs> See. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to put your 401k to pay that one off. <laughs> you know, I was going to say, the, the, the daisy chain um, beadwork, that reminds me of like, you know, being a kid and all that. But it's funny because that's almost like your gateway beading project, right? Mm -hmm. So like, like, you know, gateway, you know, they say the gateway, you know, so it just opens yeah. up your world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'm going to beat everything. I'm going to beat everything. Well, that's really funny because I still have a couple of those daisy chains that we made when I was little. And then some of my mom's beads from that too. And so um, like when I'm organizing all of my beads, I try to track where I get everything. And so I have little labels that says mom's heirloom beads. And um, every now and then I dip into them for something that... Um, mm -hmm they mostly just kind of get moved around on the shelf. 
Yeah, some of those beads you can't replace. No. Well, and some of them are so old, they're just kind of mishmashy and misshapen and mm -hmm. they're just kind of weird. They don't go with anything. So I just love looking at them and remembering being little. So what kind of beads do you like to use? Shack seed beads. Um, the prime, yeah. Ugh, anything Czech. And so um, I actually went to Czech Republic a few years oh, wow. ago um, with some, a group of jewelry designers and um, bead importers. And back then I was really only working with seed beads, just doing my three drop gourd peyote style. I wasn't really into like lots of kinds of beads. So I didn't buy a whole lot. I was kind of going more just for the history. But um, since that trip, I started doing um, these parties at the holiday time, snowflaking parties. And um, I got a snowflaking party, what's that? So I have a wire frame and I bring a boatload of beads and everybody just digs in and makes little snowflakes out of beads. And so mostly it's, um, I do a lot of office holiday parties. The Burke Museum has had me in for a few years to do their um, employee holiday party. And so from that, I started just buying like all kinds of beads. Um, and so my collection really exploded. And so I really wish I could go back now because now I really would have reason to buy stuff. But back then I was just kind of along for the ride. But, um, but yeah, so that's, I like the snowflaking um, cause it's just such a fun free activity. So for the style I do, it's so technical and exacting to do the three drop gourd style and there's no plan just do it right well so yeah so you can do it with no plan for some things but for like the re my recent piece um recipe for a quarantine oh i, I mean the snowflake the snowflake earrings i mean the snowflake snowflake parties what's that it's like it's the snowflake parties are just like an open you just oh just, yeah yeah like compared yeah. to when you're doing your three drop you have to like do a lot of focus you look she's walking to the other side of the restaurant are, are, the order's coming there are coffees I coming i just going to grab one of my snowflakes so this is a snowflake <laughs> that i so this is one i made for um the colors are inspired by our indian center here uh, united indians of all tribes there's a wood carving in there and it has those colors in there oh, and cool. so i made a lot of those for their um fundraiser that they just had and so that's a really cool center here in Seattle. It's Daybreak, um, Daybreak Star. And it's got a lot of cool history. Um, gosh, I think it was, I think they just had the 50th anniversary of the takeover of Fort Lawton. So it was um, a government installation and a bunch of natives just went over they didn't just go over but they like went and took over it and kind of reclaimed the land and now we have space for urban indians here in seattle at daybreak star is that one of the early aim uh, one of the early aim rallies it wasn't aim and i'm probably a really bad person to kind of recount the history because i'm so young <laughs> i encourage my for myself and any of the audience members to look that up and, and learn but um, but it is. But it was on. adjacent, you know. It was that time of the AIM yeah. movement, and very much inspired, and kind of happening the same time as the takeover of Alcatraz. Um, and there's very few people living now that kind of live through that. And so, um, but it's pretty cool history, and it's just a beautiful place. So maybe tomorrow we can go visit. Uh yeah. Since we're virtually here in Seattle. <laughs> Right. And I was like, I, 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 yep. I, I love the patrons of this bar because they're, you know, it's a busy place here right now. And, uh, you know, you had, you walked over there to the edge of that, the uh, counter over there and got the snowflake. <laughs> you have to look. Nobody's just like, hey, just leave it. Yeah. You can just great leave patron, your projects patron. everywhere. And, you know, that they, in Quarantino's Cafe, they, they pretty much <laughs> let everything go. I mean, look at when James <laughs> bring in like Cracker Jacks and soda and then people be selling coffee. We have an in with the owner. <laughs> they're a sponsor yeah. that's how we got up we're virtually to seattle yeah that's true they did and everybody should drink quarantino's coffee yeah quarantino's coffee 
<laughs> Back to the interview. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's talk about your work. Would you would like, let's take a look. I have some, uh, I have this set up here. Do you want to take a look? Okay, we're starting it right now. Okay, so, so while you're doing this for a few minutes, I'm gonna move on to the next segment, so. Okay. Ooh, yes, ooh, that's a lovely picture that I staged to um, submit to try to be in an art market. I didn't get into that art market, um, but that's the picture I showed him because it's kind of representative of when I do vend some of the stuff that I make and it's all, uh, except for those long loopy earrings in that teeny tiny necklace, it's all um, kind of in Oklahoma, Southern Plains style colors. And uh, yeah, and I'm wearing some of those, a pair of similar earrings. Actually, the very first pair of earrings I made like those I'm, I'm wearing now, but they're getting kind of grubby. But yeah, so that's, that's uh, some of my jewelry. So what other, I mean, so what, so is this your common color palette of what you're working with for beadwork? Yeah, I don't know why that a lot of Comanche beadwork has that blue background, that sky blue background. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I think there's a lot of traditions that will have those fire colors. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't know, to me, that just looks like real Oklahoma Comanche style um, colors. It's really, they're really pretty. Thank okay. you. And I'm always trying to get like all the colors to do like huge fades. Like I have a cane where I, th I think I did like 17 color fade on it. Wow, that's um, amazing. So but, tell uh, us about, so, so you actually had done an installation beadwork. Um, yeah, so I've done a little, a few um, art assemblages, which is, um, an assemblage, it's like a collage, but it's with three dimensional objects. And so um, this is the latest one I did that is called Recipe for a Quarantine. And the, the um, whisk is beaded in patterns um, to kind of document what was happening while we were um, uh, confined. And so, um, and then the artist statement kind of reflects <laughs> like, um, kind of what was happening, you know, a few weeks ago and still is happening a little bit. I think we got lifted a little bit, um, today. I heard our nail salons opening tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going for a while, but, um, but yeah, we're at one and a half. We're at stage one and a half out of four stages here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, so um, tell us about that design that's on the the handle. Like, what? Like, how did you come up with that design? So the first thing I came up with was the COVID design. So there's the COVID uh, nineteen virus beaded on there. So that was kind of where I started, and it's a real departure from anything I do because everything I do is always symmetrical where I have kind of an anchoring centerpiece and it's perfectly even both directions. And so I, this is the first thing I ever did. And I've always wanted to do something like that because I see other people's work and especially like older work and it's just different like that. And so there's the COVID pattern. I did some masks. Um, I did cherry blossoms because that happened while we were in quarantine and then the city streets because we were just walking so much. That's all we really could do here. Mm -hmm. um, and then some social distancing dots mm -hmm. and the time. I tried to bead time at the very top. <laughs> but um, so then I also wrote an actual recipe for quarantine. Um, and then paired it with a homemade face mask because when we were first doing face masks, I was making my own face masks out of um, paper napkins. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's interviews playing on the iPad behind there because anyway, and so, um, and then the, the origami um, Crane represents our neighbor and his wife who both um, got COVID-19 and my neighbor 
um, the husband passed away and then, but the wife recovered and had to move um, because she wasn't able to live on her own. And so it just kind of, you know, just we're cooking so much at home and that big whisk also has a long story because my husband worked at Borders Books and Music. Oh my gosh, 19, 1999, uh, we had the WTO riots and uh, he was working downtown at Borders Book and Music. So last time we had some big riots here in the city. And anyway, so when that closed down, we got that giant whisk from the kitchen and we never use it. It's just always in our drawer. And every time I open the drawer, I was just like, oh, I want to bead that. And so it's like, we're in quarantine. So I'm like, I'm going to freaking bead that now. So I did it. And um, so, yeah, and all those little pieces have a story. My mom's recipe for fry breads in the recipe box. And mm -hmm. that recipe box was a gift from a good friend of mine um, who was also, you know, we were in school together during the WTO riots. And when I say WTO riots, a World Trade Organization met here in Seattle in 1999. And I was in college at the community college up on Capitol Hill, which is a real base of social activism. And there was just a lot of stuff going on there. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I don't know, just everything, lots of little pieces. So that's well, my really recipe for quarantine. And it's gonna be in the Museum of History um, in Tacoma for their show, their annual in the spirit show. That's really cool. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Yeah, that's just, I beaded that a long time ago. I just thought it was fun since we were here at the coffee shop to share a coffee scoop. Um, I think, really fun. <laughs> I don't know what happened to that. I might've given it to my aunt. I can't remember what happened to that scoop, but it was one of my first, and those are little tiny 13, um, oh, wow. 13 Charlotte beads. But that's that really neat. Cool. Oh yeah, so this was like my very first um, piece um, that was in a, a show called Yahao. And so Yahao here is one of the, um, Lashutseed is the Coast Salish language here uh, for the people here. And the Yahao means um, uh, coming together to push up the sky. And it's a really powerful story here of when everybody was, um, had to be low because the sky was so low. And then everybody got together and got this word to say, yeah, how to say, let's all come together and push up the sky. And so that's how people, um, that's how we get to like walk upright now and work together as people. Um, but that, sh that piece, so I don't know if I told you all this. So Seattle is also a real hotbed for startups and the startup scene here yeah, is really true. exciting. And everybody's always trying to come up with a big idea and get investors for it. Um, it's a real interesting scene. And so I uh, invented a hairstyling device that I was gonna try to like turn into a business. Uh, it was called the air hand and it's um, a glove you wear to um, dry your hair with your own hand. And so you attach it to your hair dryer and it blows air out of your own hand to dry your hair. So I was doing that for a while and it was just a weird scene, like no natives, not a lot of um, indigenous influence. So I came up with this piece as a reaction to that experience and I call it value. Um, because I always felt like I was in this weird space with all these people that had just different from me and trying to explain like I'm from an indigenous community and like the way we measure wealth is different from you. And um, so that was kind of what that piece is saying of like how, how we as indigenous people um, just have a different sense of value that's not money. Well, I think that it, I, what I think is interesting about it is that you made the currency beadwork. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty neat. That's a very, uh, I think, a, a different way to approach it. I think that was interesting. Thank you. Okay, you want to know a secret? I, I'm going to out. I'm going to, because there's how, there's not a lot of people here. I'm going to tell a secret about that piece. So it was exhibited in this big show, and it was a, all Indigenous, all local Indigenous people. Um, 
I could not find anything to fill those quarter wrappers with that filled it like it would fill with quarters. So I mm -hmm. actually filled it with quarters until the bead at the end. <laughs> so, and it was not in a like, can like container or anything. It was just open to the public. So at any time, anybody could have just like gotten like <laughs> $40 in quarters if they just swiped that. <laughs> I honestly, honestly it kind of brings back some memories when I first started powering back in the early nineties. Uh, you know, it's like go to power and like, all right, how we get home? Break out some rolls of quarters, I'm out of cash. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've paid my. I've got. I've come home three states away from roll, col, rolls of quarters before in the early days of my life. <laughs> well, Bring back some memories, definitely. Tell us about the salt and, salt and pepper shakers. So those are uh, shakers are from IKEA, and just anything, anytime I see anything round, I'm just like, oh, I could bead that. And I just remember yeah. being little and going, seeing those, my aunt's house and different people. You just, I don't know, you'd see them around, and so I just, it's fun to do something kind of big because you can do a lot of design on it, um, but you can really see from that um, when you look at the top the starting row. So this, you will never get the same answer twice from anybody about what to call this style. Um, some people call it gourd, some people call it peyote. Um, there's a lot of history with both of those words that is not really known, I don't think. Um, but um, in my tradition, what I've been told is that if you're using beadwork in um, Native American church peyote ceremony, you're calling it peyote. And if you're not, it's gourd. So it doesn't matter if it's this three drop style or the two drop style, it, it, that's the way it is. But it's all confusing. It's a mishmash. And I actually have um, the Burke Museum did a video, but they haven't put it out yet where I talk about, I actually just go through a bunch of books and like, I think I've got six books and everybody says some, calls it something different, including Scott Sutton. <laughs> oh, you've been well, Scott Sutton. coming up. <laughs> that's got um, a, lot of for a lot of people for a long time. That's cool stuff. But this one, so, you know, even if you call it three drop, there's another style called three drop that's not this. So yeah. I don't know, you know, it's like yeah. we have, we just don't have enough words for everything you're talking about because i i know a lot of different owners of bead stores and mm -hmm. what they were telling me i was i one of the gals wanted to learn how to do this the three drop and i told her i said it's a totally different stitch and she's like i know how to do three drop i'm like but what you're showing me is not three drop and so we had a whole conversation ourselves about how it wasn't the same technique and what she's saying three drop for a modern beater a modern beater three drop is like brick stitch right you know like where it's up down up down with uh -huh. one. but instead of going up down up down on one bead you go up down up down with three beads i know so Weird. it's just it's like the same thing i know it's so confusing but so for whatever this style is like you can really recognize it with the chevrons because the chevrons like with, with other styles, they're gonna be perfectly symmetrical, like an arrow. Mm -hmm. But with this style, it's just like, ee, just a teeny weeny bit off. And um, people freak out a little bit over it because of the math involved. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not hard. I have a little video on there that explains um, how to do the count, but you have to do your patterns with numbers divisible by six because that chevron yep. pattern repeats every sixth bead. Yep. And um, so it's not hard. I have an Excel spreadsheet you can download. Mm -hmm. Easy peasy. Don't let those numbers mess you around. So we do call it three drop at our store. Yeah, I know. So Everybody, it's like three drop, three drop peyote. That's what we call I it. I think we just need to have like a big um, conference and like just come <laughs> up with all new names for everything. Because like really like peyote gets called everything gets called peyote it's like we just don't have any more words it sounds like a council yeah. in nicaea for beadwork <laughs> let's have a council meeting okay <laughs> started right here okay we'll lay out what everything is for the next couple few thousand years all right <laughs> okay so i think this is the last slide okay so I should, you more, I should have sent you more slides i think i was supposed to but 
That's all right. I mean, all that's pretty good. Was pretty outstanding. We had a really good discussion about your work. Thanks. I think we had such a good discussion that we're going to actually go over our time a little bit and then go over a little more. So you're going to have to drink some more coffee and stay awake even longer. Yes, we <laughs> are. Uh, we're going to put another order for coffee. Yes, we need to put hey, I'm just giving it. I'm giving a shout out to Vivian in the comments because she says she worked at Borders for 20 years. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Vivian's cool, cool people. Yes, <laughs> we've met Vivian from all the craft nights. So that's pretty cool. We got some people from Oregon visiting. We have some people from Arizona, some of my friends. It's pretty cool. So, hey, uh, yeah, I think we need to support this uh, small business, Quarantino's Cafe. Uh, yes. Uh, so Cynthia, what do you want to order? We should tell the order person what we want. Ooh, I think I want a double tall decaffeinated half calf, one pump white chocolate, uh, two packets of sweet and low non-fat oat milk latte. And what size? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's got to be like a triple grande, uh, yeah, triple grande frenito size. Okay. I, I'm going to order a um, double caffeinated three pump peppermint with one pump of mocha. Is that a and shoe? It's be half soy, half almond milk with room. And it's going to be inside a a venti cup but i want it in i want the grande size an italian shoe yeah. <laughs> oh and then also with some whipped cream on the top what <laughs> language you spoken so in seattle great. so james um yes? what do you like i don't know what i like with what y'all just said was that english so so i'll okay. just I, I admittedly i am not the most sophisticated person in a coffee shop you know, kind of like I'm a redneck thinking, walking six, yeah. Saks Fifth Avenue. You know, I think that James. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of rural farm reg guy here. I think James might like a um, dark brew with what? pineapple, um, pineapple, um, pineapple syrup, like the flavor, like maybe three pumps of pineapple, and then you can pop pineapple. Um, yeah, it's so good. Have you ever tried that? I don't know. <laughs> All I know is we're in a coffee shop, and yeah. So, so would you like that? Because we can order that coffee with pineapple I, in it for you. Just get a tea. Oh, tea. Okay. Well, Cynthia, what kind of tea can we recommend for him? Well, do you want hot or iced? Ice, because yeah. like hot ice, I, ice, do, I guess. I know what that means. You could do sweet matcha. Yeah, that could be good. Is that like macho? <laughs> I'm a guy. I'll flex and what about, look tough. What about the um there's I think that we have there's some um orange orange raspberry essence um herbal tea with a um with a hint of uh lime. Is that like a lime like you see is that a tea with like what was it again? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. You know what? Maybe, maybe James just needs uh, an Earl Grey tea. I can recognize that because I saw Jean Luc Picard play that on order that on Star Trek. Okay, I think that's what. I don't know what it is, but it's British. But I at least recognize that term. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Everything so else there, I'm looking at going. Um, I know that tea's got to have less options apparently than coffee because there's less words I I, I understood. <laughs> What about um, what about for snacks? For what? You can't just like drink this and not have a snack too. Well, I have a Cracker Jack. <laughs> Guys, I can spell it. I was gonna suggest a pineapple. I mean, a pumpkin scone with some um, cream cheese cream cheese frosting. Ooh, that sounds good. Do those things go together naturally, or is that like a violation of natural law? I think that actually that would be really good with Earl Grey tea. Mm -hmm. Or maybe like some banana nut butter honey bread. Oh, yeah. Is that for dunking? A little bit of cinnamon and sugar on the top of that. You put that on top of the, the stuff you dunk? Yes. How about just a tea? 
with peach, <laughs> unsweetened. Oh, and I got blurry. It was like my hey, eyes. This is during this little sketch. You're probably giving real coffees, and I don't know if you are or not. <laughs> with that, I think I'll just stick with my uh, the green tea I snuck into Quarantinos. <laughs> Because I know I won't be running for the bathroom with a padlock on it in 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. And with that, I think, do we need some trivia questions? Oh, yeah, we need to do trivia. Oh, my gosh. Look at it. It's like, seriously. <laughs> okay. All right. So. Let me, let me, let me get the graphic because I spent the time to do this. Wait, wait, wait. wait. What, are our tra what are our trivia prizes for this week? Our trivia prizes, one from Elk Rat Traders, will be a small. And the pictures didn't come out, so I can't show them. And they're buried in their, they're buried out in the store. The, uh the uh, storage area and studio out there near the room, but is a small pair of what's called legal eagle feather earrings. They're feather earrings, probably about two inches long that I cut trims, shoot the tip with an airbrush and make it look like miniature eagle feathers with clips that are earrings. Oh, very nice. And this week, just like last week, we're gonna give away a free scarf to the winner for our trivia questions. Um, they get to pick a metallic or non-metallic, and they get to also pick the color. Is so, it flavored like a mocha latte, half half pineapple, half grapefruit, mocha chino coffee with ice and let me chocolate? Tell you, it doesn't smell like that. <laughs> these scarves, Just asking. These scarves, you know, it's a funny thing about these scarves that people remember. Like they'll say, these scarves always have kind of like a funny smell. Like it's like they, it's 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 mm -hmm. not hard to explain. Like they'll say, like, oh yeah, those are the, that's the smell of the scarves. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> so from blue dot beadwork, I have a pair. I call these um, little dab earrings. So when I started doing these earrings, I kept going longer and loopier. And I was at a show and. Um, her name was Deb and she said, could you make some for me? Because I, my profile just can't accommodate long earrings. So I started making these little ones and I call them, call them little Debs after her. Uh -huh. <laughs> there they are. Oh wait, you can't see them if I, there they are. Yeah, if you keep it in front of your face, it's like if you close the face, you don't like turn on an angle or it will disappear into the coffee shop. They are. Very nice, okay. Should I show, should I show uh, do the little feather trick with the, with the uh, sweet grass feather and show that. Oh, to yeah. Uh, you guys here. need to see this. Okay. You, you know, at Cornfields Cafe, they have these special feathers um, on display. Okay. Only at Quarantino's Cafe. People watch the show in the past know what I'm about to do. Okay. This is why you got to be careful with the angles of your beadwork because this could happen. Let me do this. <laughs> It's a magical feather, guys. This is like a big deal. It is fully magical. Fully magical. And the visual is invisible because it's it is, green. It's very, like very hard to paint a feather that has an opaque, opaque transparency. Yeah. Wow. You can totally see through me right now and Dave, behind. Your eyes, look. I'm about to go. <laughs> like a Cylon. You need, wait, did I see the green? Well, holy cow, the green showed up. The light. <laughs> All right, well, it's like this. I could do this and go, look, you can see through my head. There's nothing on the other side. <laughs> like I already, like, now it's like so everybody already knew that anyway. Okay. Okay, so, so we're gonna get the trivia questions ready. All right, let me get the little thing here up. All right, for everyone, this week's trivia questions, you need to have them sent in, emailed in to late night craft talk at gmail.com by midnight Sunday night. That's this Sunday at midnight, so you got a couple days to do this to get them in. And remember to email them in to late night craft talk at gmail.com, Sunday and, midnight. And then also another thing that people say, hey, I didn't get a chance to see this, the questions. Okay, this broadcast will be on our Facebook page forever. And then it will Never. also be on <laughs> YouTube. So you can always replay this video on Facebook and you can write down the questions and you could literally Google it. I mean, we are not saying you can't use the internet to look up the answer because if anything, it makes you smarter because you're like, oh, what's the answer? Oh, I know the answer now. So you're more than welcome to use the internet 
to look up the trivia questions. You do not have to know these without like any kind of assistance. It's actually something, you learn something new every time, right? So please don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed. You can look on the internet for the answers. I just want to say that because some people are saying they didn't know the answer. So anyway, I thought it'd be important to share. Okay, so trivia questions. Okay. Hey, you ready? Am I taking the first two? Yes. Yes, ma'am. All right. So the first trivia question is, this country produces about one third of the world's coffee. Again, the question is, this country produces about one third of the world's coffee. Time for question number two. What was the name of the first Starbucks cafe? Again, question two is, what was the name of the first Starbucks cafe? So like the actual storefront, okay? So I just wanna make sure you guys knew that. Okay, so my, which type of coffee has more caffeine? Ooh, interesting. That is going to be either, I see that it, I've left a part of this out, uh, Robusta or Arabica. So which type of coffee has more caffeine? I feel like I'm reliving that sketch from three minutes ago. <laughs> I don't know coffee. True or false? A person can overdose on coffee. True or false? A person can overdose on coffee. Hey, can I read that? Can, <laughs> I, can I take a chance to read that? Yeah, go for it. True or false? Can a person overdose on coffee? I don't know. Is it? <laughs> Caffeine much? <laughs> okay, <laughs> Sophia, go for it. Okay, what country has the most coffee drinkers? Wow. So you gotta, you gotta say it too then. Okay, what country has the most coffee drinkers? Okay. <laughs> what kind of plant does coffee grow on? Oh, I had bad grammar, sorry. <laughs> We did. What, what kind of? I'm sorry. What okay, is, last what question. Is, <laughs> I knew what you meant. I'm a professional. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what kind of plant does coffee grow on? Yes, it's a type, like a type of plant. Like there's it's different not a coffee types plant. Of plant. It's not a coffee plant. <laughs> like the type of plant. <laughs> oh, so like you know, like it, what it's classified as. Like what like kind of plant? You know, okay. Audrey too. <laughs> so make sure, don't forget to email your answers to late night craft talk at gmail.com. And they're due by midnight, the Sunday after the show. And seriously, you guys can look it up on the internet. <laughs> it's okay. I am not opposed to that. And we are okay with that. Hey, Bubba, it's always got to be purple. It's open book studying. <laughs> I love the graphics I have. And then when Severe goes once, it's like, I wonder what color is going to be on that graphic. Yeah. Purple! Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know what? Yeah. I just realized. Okay, so our next segment, because like we, we had like such a great time talking with Cynthia. We actually have so much extra content. We're going to totally do it. Yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So I'm going to do my, I'm going to do my next thing. Okay. Here we go. So Cynthia, she loves puzzles. So what we did was we decided to come up with a puzzle game for each one of us. And um, we're gonna have to guess what the picture is underneath by the puzzle pieces that are revealing the picture. Okay? So this is gonna be kind of fun. <laughs> jigsaw puzzles without jigsaw hosting it. I feel yes. safe with my limbs. Okay, all right. So Cynthia, this one's for you. You notice the color of the puzzle is coffee color. <laughs> Not purple. That was intentional. Okay. <laughs> so just when you when you think you know what it is, just just shout it out. Is it candy? Is it bag of chips? Bacon? No. Um it's Oh, oh, it's the gum wall. Oh, gross. Oh, oh. Always good to give to, but not take from on that thing. Gross. <laughs> I thought that would 
would be too funny for you because I'm like, what kind of famous Seattle things do they have out there? And they have a famous gum wall. <laughs> so yeah, this is so when you go and you see the flying fish, this is just below where that is. And everybody goes and chews gum and sticks it on the wall. Not only is it disgusting, it's <laughs> one of the worst smells of like spit oh my sugar in the world. And every few years they have to power wash it off and it just gets started. It. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty gross. It's so funny. <laughs> you should look up Salvation Mountain on the internet sometime. I don't live far from there. <laughs> You know what's really funny when I was in junior high and high school and I played softball for the rec teams they the dugouts were covered with gum on the inside and it was the thing to put gum on the dugouts like that was <laughs> <laughs> I get it I get it okay James we have yours all right here we go you know what's the colors? blue and greenish why would it be blue and green James because yellow and blue make greenish and there's no yellow so you're always on the river turn. and you always wear a green hat <laughs> uh, actually because the hat is actually black but you can see where there's a hole it's right like there because it's, it's green it's like a green hat <laughs> it's the lighting in the cafe <laughs> if we walked outside it would not be purple yes i know but see actually I don't think all I'm right let's take a look purple hair. okay james you ready yep all right just shout it out when you see it, just shout I see, it out. okay. Star Trek Enterprise, Galaxy Class, Starfleet uniform that looks like something Wesley would wear. Wesley Crush from the Star Trek net. And yep, Picard talking to Wesley on the on the uh, Enterprise Galaxy Class. <laughs> All I can say is I look at that and want to say, shut up, Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> I love Wesley Crusher. He's so, he was so cute. Aw. And Jean-Luc Picard, he's my captain. <laughs> okay, here's Picard's mine. That's awesome, except for the new TV series. Okay. Anyway. So let me see what this is. James set this up for me. I don't know what the picture is underneath. It, and as promised, it's not Jar Jar Pickles. Oh, Why is you. it purple and purple? Because purple's my favorite color. Oh, nice. <laughs> I knew we were building to this. That's why I'm hacking on purple all of a sudden. I'm yeah. going to give up after this. Actually, like I said, you can't really see it in here, but I do have purple hair. Oh, I totally see it. Looks good. <laughs> okay. Try with her hands. Okay. Oh, I already I probably really looked at it. Star Star Wars because there's always the gangways where you like fall to the depths and there's no no ra railings. There's black. Okay. I see. Okay, there's Luke. Okay, it has to be Darth Vader on the other side. Luke, I am your father. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why would anyone have like you know for OSHA? I mean, like safety. Like they have all the, <laughs> the gangways where they're like really like narrow. They're only like six inches wide, and they have to walk across it with no railings on the sides. It makes no sense to me. Yeah. I can have this for hours. <laughs> hey, Savia, Savia. <laughs> I'm not your father. Okay, good. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> that would be weird because we're about the same age. It's really okay. weird. <laughs> like, wow, you're like my estranged dad, and you're only like a couple years older than me. <laughs> that would be even weirder. Time is relative, <laughs> especially my relatives. Okay. That's so weird. Oh yes, because look at I'm wearing a Star Wars T-shirt. <laughs> at which point you would be disowned if I was your father. Shut up, Wesley. Okay. Okay. All right. So do we want to do the do we want to do the sing along? I'm thinking let's do it after because we're at eleven. So let's close that part of the program. So let's, okay. see, let's see what we're doing next week. We'll move on to sing along and questions, questions, questions. Yeah. All right. Okay. So Savannah, what's happening next week on the show? Oh, next week. Who we oh, have? Let me look at my schedule. <laughs> I have to get my my screen out of this thing, Carolyn. That's crazy, huh? Okay, let's see. Our next guest is Mac Lopez. He is a flute player um, no, from Whirlwind awesome. Studios. Awesome and role. we're very excited about him coming on our show. Um, this will be the first musician we've had. So 
it's really interesting all these guests we have we try to have a really good variety of people and like i said we're we're booked all the way through july right now so this is like pretty cool um, guests going all the way into august that's awesome yeah, yeah that this is something to look forward to every week we have a new guest so and what okay. Right. Right okay and what we might see next week we might do it we might not we'll continue with the theme of late night craft talk on the road across america at which point i will get lost out in the desert and decide to start my own country and king myself of the king of the country and form a monog monarchy 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 nation <laughs> i was about to say malarkey but monarchy a malarkey monarchy and this is what it might look like And there we go. Presenting your king, the Admiral General of Make Benefit Great Nation of Taco Stand, King James. I do declare this day a national holiday in honor of me. <laughs> Praetorian God, bring me my royal menu from La Toca Luca, Stan. And that's what it might look like. Very interesting. Very yes, it would. It could be. You know, we just imagine so well going diddly loop, diddly loop, diddly loop. All right. Jim so likes to do these we'll really into. funny little stories that he like does all these little weird videos all the time. Just so you guys know, it's really entertaining. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. I've now I feel bad and self conscious. <laughs> all right. So we're moving on to the part of the show that's now af now over time where we move on to more interviews. But before we do that, we want to do something we so they are desperately trying to experiment with it, and we're going to go through with it, even though it didn't go so well earlier in the evening. Yes. We're going to do karaoke Acapella. with grunge bands. Acapella. Acapella, because Facebook deletes the uh, live music and mutes it they when we're doing do karaoke. Like even if yeah. we're making our own vocals, they don't allow it. I don't and we're not going to go with just D with any grunge song. We're going with the original that predates grunge that influenced a generation. Okay, so it's gonna be a surprise. You guys are gonna see. So feel free, Cynthia, to sing along. Okay. okay. Do we wanna take, as each screen pops up, every time it changes the lyrics, do we wanna take turns? Oh no. We <laughs> can sing all at the same time. That'll make it fun. Okay. Or you wanna actually, do you wanna take turns? It would work out better. All right, okay, so uh, James, we'll see, you want we'll to start see how it evolves or devolves. James, you get to start, okay? All right, <clears throat> let All me right. get my singing voice ready because I'm still finding a head cold. Okay, so we are going to start it. Oh no! Here we go, here we go, here we go. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Gotta do the head banging. <laughs> That's impossible. <laughs> oh my He's God. not, he's not. <laughs> okay, Wait. ready James? Go ahead. Go. Follow the blue. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. I'll go next. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. Okay, Cynthia. I'm just a poor boy. I need no sympathy, cause I'm easy come, easy go, little high, little low. Was fast on that. Any way the wind blows, doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> to me. <laughs> <laughs> Mama. 
just kill the man. Put a gun against his head. Dude, I'm being told I'm saying to pull my trigger now he's dead. I know it seems mama. Mama, life has just begun. But now I'm gone and throw it all away. Mama, ooh, didn't mean to make you cry. I still didn't mean to make you cry at all. I'm not back this time tomorrow. Carry on, carry on, as if nothing really matters. (laughs) Yeah. Too late. It hasn't queued up. I guess it's too late. There you go. (laughs) My time has come. And shivers on my spine, body's aching all the time. Well, goodbye, everybody. I've got to go. Gotta leave you all behind and face the truth. Mm-hmm. Oh, Come on, I don't want to die. I sometimes wish I'd never been born at all. (laughs) (laughs) Music's going to run out. And it's going to go. Moving on. Moving on. I know I'm trying to like hear the. Something to see here. <laughs> Wait, I haven't stopped it. I steal the silhouette of a man. Oh got a moosh, got a moosh. Will you do the fandango? Oh, wait, this is me, Thunderbolt yes. and Lightning. Very, very frightening. Galileo, 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 Figurio, Mafa, Magnifico. <laughs> I'm just a poor boy. Nobody loves me. He's just a poor boy from a poor family. Spared him his life from this monstrosity. <laughs> easy come, easy go. Will you let me go? Milla, no, we will not let you go. With Milla, we will not let you go. We will let you go. We will not let you go. Let you go. Let me go. No, 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 no. Oh, mama mia, mama mia, mama mia, let me go. Yeah, the devil put a sign for me. Okay, everyone's like, for me, for me. And that's. Oh, wait, is this who's. If that's me, I don't know. Just me, uh, uh, I don't yeah. even know what's gonna do. Leave me again. I'm sorry. Oh, oh. baby, oh, can't do this to me, baby. Just, just gotta get out. Just gotta get right out of here. I guess the last line here. Gonna go. Gonna go. Do 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 Come on, come on. It's doing a musical. Ah. Okay. Okay. Wait, say it there. Nothing really matters. Anyone can see. Nothing really matters. Nothing really matters to me. Okay, last line, all three of us. Last line, all three of us. Okay, ready for it. <laughs> and any way the way. Any way the way. Hoorah. Wow. So I think it definitely would have been a lot easier with some music cues in the back. 
Yes, but. But that was fun. Right? Awesome stuff. <laughs> How much was everybody headbanging? <sighs> I, I was, I, I'm sure that we had people headbanging. There better be. The audience better be going, I need me an ibuprofen now, but that was a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> or they're like, those people's crazy. Cray cray. <laughs> I can be okay. like a uh, magic mushroom or a thund cats of thunder going, I see you uh, banging your head. Yes. Head banging. <laughs> but that does not mean against the table. No wonder you are injured. Okay. Yes. So, okay, everyone. So um, we are now at the later portion of our show. And um, feel free to send in any questions for Cynthia. Uh, we have some questions already that have come in and we're starting to, um, we're gonna start asking those questions for her. So uh, one of the questions that we had asked was, um, been asked is uh, what are craft, are you, you said you had craft parties? Yeah, so, um... Yeah, basically here in Seattle, it's kind of hyper local. Um, I pack up a bunch of beads and it's mostly just been holidays um, do, with the doing the little snowflakes. Um, but then because of quarantine, um, I've been doing some online bead lessons. And so uh, I've gotten hired out by a couple organizations to do online bead lessons for them. But I've also um, have the video lessons that you can follow along with. And then, um, uh, yeah. So, and then sometimes I just randomly will get on Facebook and just say like, hey, I'm gonna do a lesson. So it's been pretty irregular about what I do. Um, so, so yeah, just tune in to like follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And um, if you really wanna do a lesson, you know, sometimes I just get a group of people together and we do it. So it really, you can only really do it with about six people because it's so technical and time intensive. And so basically like I'm trying to explain it to you at home and then like you do it. And then I, you, then you like hold it up to the camera and I'll be like, yeah, that's right. Or no, that's wrong. Or I don't know what the hell you did. I'm sorry. Just take it apart and start over again. Yeah. So, yeah. Sometimes so, it's yeah. hard. So yeah, and then, yeah. So just go to my website too, cause I just rebuilt my website and I kind of put a lot of what I do on there. There's still a few little holes in there, but um, there's a lot of pictures from the parties and you can just really see how much fun fun they are. Yeah, with the classes, um, it's, it's I'm really- I'm trying to see if my bottle of tea, oh, there it goes. There it goes. Cheers. <laughs> Magical. When you said, you know, see it's little holes in there. I decided to finally see if, my tea would disappear. Okay. So you're drinking magical tea. with a novelty. Tea. <laughs> drinking magical tea. James and the magical tea. <laughs> yes, when I write it, I'm on top of, what's that dragon called from Never Ending Story? Uh, Falcor. When I drink it, I'm writing Falcor you through Falcor? the sky. Oh my gosh, I love Falcor. <laughs> yeah, I, I write now, if I do this, Falcor dragon. will appear and I'll be like, Whoosh. Yes, yes. So do you teach, so not during the quarantine, do you teach classes like person to person? Is that something that you did before? Or you did yeah, so a lot of it has been either like Snoqualmie tribe has hired me to work with their elders, a couple of Native American um, Indian ed programs to work with their students. Uh, so it's been kind of, yeah, I don't know. I just get kind of booked out by people in the community that I know. Um, and then I, but I don't have my own studio space. And so um, I'm hope, I mean, well, like last year I was hoping um, I was gonna partner up with somebody to rent out her studio space, um, but we don't know what's gonna happen. Like, we don't know what will happen in the fall if we're gonna be able to get together again. Uh, so all I can say is just like, follow me on my socials to see what happens. Um, but you don't have to wait for in-person. I mean, you really can um, access this information and with the help of video tutorials and online communities, you really can learn this on your own. It's tremendously difficult and I don't really advocate that approach. 
Um, but a lot of people just don't have somebody in their family to teach them. They don't have somebody in their community to share this with them. And so um, the information is out there, but really just ask a lot of questions. Um, I don't think I mentioned like when I was learning back in the day, I don't know if anybody remembers powwow.com and they had the message boards. This is before Facebook. And there was a guy on there, Powwow Bum 49, like, where are you, Powwow Bum 49? Where did you go? He was really nice and he would answer, like, add to ask him questions and he'd answer. And uh, he was real helpful to me. And there's another guy out here too that's a really awesome beater that um, was also a lot of help to me. But now, I mean, all of these groups on Facebook, there's just so many ways to ask for help and there's so much information out there that your answer is probably out there if you know how to dig and search um, for it. But Cynthia, I, I have a little studio space right over here. Oh yeah. Right there. <laughs> want to rent some of it out. It's a lot of area. It's All right. Work. Taking a little well, bit of you a think, break. Will Jeff, will Jeff Bezos give me a ride to get there? <laughs> I think you want to ask actually Elon Musk. He's the one that actually has- Oh wait, right. <laughs> He's the one who actually has a dragon capsule at the International Space Station that's like getting my billionaires right confused. Right now. Just, over the just over the ridge. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is proof that the Earth's flat. You know, what'd be really interesting is beating in space. Huh? Beating oh in space would be nuts. Oh my gosh. That makes me think of that flaming lip song. Do you realize? Yeah. Who sung that? Oh I'm man. I'm going to go back inside the coffee shop. That? Sing that one next week for me, please. Which one? But, uh, Consider it. Yeah. Beating in space. Huh. It. Wait, you remember the Muppet show? Pigs in space? Pigs in space. He does in space. You know, I was thinking about it. You know, right now, all those people up in space, they have no gravity, right? No gravity. I wonder what the actual technology would be to actually make people have gravity in space. Interesting. You know? Well, the downward I, force. You need to watch the expanse. I've been thinking about that because, you know, you watch Star Trek, you watch Star Wars, you watch any of those space movies, space shows, everything has anti gravity. They have the anti gravity on their. Dr. Beam stuff like that. But there's a whole movie called Interstellar that's based on that whole subject. When do we suddenly become a STEM program, a STEM show, talk show, which is not know. a bad thing. I didn't even get into how much math and science is involved in beating. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can totally geek out on that. But that's another, that's like a whole other. I have a relative is literally a retired rocket scientist. He got into beadwork and he's like, this is as much as anything with the patterns in the mouth he does. <laughs> algorithms on beadwork. The thing is. On CAD programs on beadwork. Cynthia would know this. When you go to the Czech Republic and mm. you go to the factories and they talk about the, the recipes that mm. they have to make the glass mm -hmm. because, you know, you're looking at the glass hot and it looks like the same color. Mm -hmm. You know, it all looks red, but you have green, blue, you know, purple, orange, yellow. I mean, all these colors and it's hot and it's red. Like it's like burning red hot. But when it cools, it changes the colors that it is. Um, I don't. Well, and even you don't even have to go to Czech Republic for that because here in Seattle, there's so much glass blowing, not related to beads so much, but just um, we have in Tacoma, there's the Museum of Glass and Dale Chihuly, big, but there's just a lot of glass artists up here. And, and yet, like, even you can just walk down to my neighborhood and watch them blow glass. There's a lot of places we can visit where you just watch them blow glass. It's pretty damn cool. So, Dave, you're giving me crap for uh, bringing my own food into Quarantino's and you're drinking from a Dixie cup? It's from Quarantino's. Quarantino's a little higher class than a Dixie cup. No, this is actually not Dixie We're playing innocent. Oh, now you make it disappear. Yeah, the, spe the special coffee it requires a lime. See, look, I didn't bring a cup in. I can make my tea disappear. <laughs> Somehow. Okay, there it is. This is the water cup from the water station at the, at the place. Gotcha. <laughs> and here's their coffee carafe that I have right here. <laughs> so 
I don't know, James. <laughs> but gotcha. I do want to make a comment before I forget to. Whoop, I'm talking with my mouth full. Well, I told you, I'm kind of a rogue dude. Vivian, looking at your ups. I was just looking at a post from Vivian that says lead boots, no gravity in space. Cynthia. Yes. Your beadwork and luck and a lot of that, what you have, your artwork is very nuanced, kind of subtle in a ways, your, your stuff, especially the quarter rolls with the beads coming out of it was very subtle, but very neon, you know, in very, very much uh, stands out what you said. I, I appreciate some of your subtle, the subtleties you put to it. Very well done. It just, you reminded me of a beat, uh, lady I met back in 97 at a pow in India when that pow was first starting up. Um, that's when they used to get like 800, 900 dancers on a Saturday night. It was like being to a medium-sized Oklahoma powwow. <laughs> and she came in and she actually had beaded the handles to a cook, to a, you know, what do they call that, a bread cookie roller? Oh, a rolling pin? Yeah, rolling pin. Thank you. Because, you know, me in English, apparently, like <laughs> me in coffee drinks. Uh, she'd actually beaded a rolling pin and she's wearing a pair of, uh, pair of black checks that she completely beaded on the canvas. Wow. To the checks and this and that and like the bowling pin, your rolling pin. She's like, it's because I can. And <laughs> I was looking at some of the, like the medicine wheels, the way she did the intricacies of her chucks. And she did a couple other shoes, some vans where she just beaded the tongue of the shoe. And I'm like, that's neat. And, and she had a lot of subtle details on there and your beadwork's reminding me of hers, what she had, because, you know, you look at the beadwork, but when you look at the subtle symbolism she put in and whatnot, I'm seeing a lot of that there. So very much a compliment when you remind me, she's one of the most, one of the best beaters I've ever met but one of the most creative people I've ever met. Hmm. And I'm very much appreciating your work. It's very, very nice seeing that and talking with you Great. on this. Thank you. And uh, just, to, just want to get that out there before I said, before I, I we, we went off the air. Yeah, Thank you know, you. one of the things that I thought was interesting about your beadwork is that you're making, you're taking almost like a fine arts approach mm -hmm. to your beadwork which most of the time um, beadwork is really showcased in a way where it's not necessarily fine arts. It's, it's, it's uh, presented in a craft, arts and crafts um, way. And um, I went to school for fine arts and the way of presenting them is more like an installation art. When you say art assemblages, mm -hmm. it reminds me a lot of installation art and where installations, you know, where you create these environments with things that you've made Mm -hmm. So that was saying that I noticed that because that seemed a little different than most of the applications of. Mm, um, thanks. Thanks for saying that. It's really nice. I mean, I have, I went to school and got a business degree. And so I really have no training in the arts other than just going to museums. And um, I do feel like it's kind of an upper underrepresented medium, even in native um, focused museums. And so um, I really do want to try to like, raise it a little bit and you know get people to understand it because I just don't think people a lot of times just don't know what they're looking at and so that's one of the things I just want to try to train people's eyes to know even if we all have these mishmash of names for all these different things um, just so that that they can recognize uh, what they're getting and you know for native and non-native people because you know in our markets you know the non-native people are a huge um, part of our customer base. And so just to kind of train them to know what they're getting um, and for us as native people to be able to talk about it to them um, and each other. So uh, yeah, so I just, thanks. I really am glad I got to come on the show and share it with people and you and um, just, yeah, here's some nice things. It was really nice to hear you say nice things. One of the things I hope that people would take from this interview with you and even people that take your classes that do this is to walk over and realize that the native art medium, you know, art medium in the native world is much broader than give it credit for. I got into a conversation with a person that was a, a curator, had a job along those lines over at the Autry in Los Angeles. And his opinion was that there's not going to be any outstanding native artists in the general, you know, a, a broader sense of the general public where they're going to become that well known a name uh, because he says that the culture makes it too limit on the individual. And I'm like, um, but you know, I, I didn't know how to quite say it in a way that um, he could, he could under, he could understand 
that with that you know with the, within the limits of the culture uh because he's just thinking just general geometric patterns and stuff like that that you basically make you know talk with you that if you could see that part of it you basically realize he's sticking his foot in his mouth <laughs> sometimes the proper words where it becomes very eloquent does leave my oklahoma mouth my rural, rural oklahoma mouth wait where in oklahoma, sometimes comes out. Where in huh? oklahoma are you from transplanted okies from uh around uh weatherford in clinton oh wow because huh. you know i grew right, up the, the, fa the families from there still have an older brother in oklahoma city moved back yeah but uh transplanted uh, uh, the coachella valley and imperial valley at the time we came out was full of a lot of transplanted texans and okies ah yeah, it's know. possible to grow up over here and have back in that time and still have a uh, an oklahoma accent even though you're from southern california <laughs> which is unusual but welcome to that part of california <laughs> kind of like florida the further north you get the more southern it gets southern california the further east you go in southern california the more it doesn't isn't like the coast <laughs> and the people anyway looks more like arizona Cynthia, With lots of cigars. So, do you bead for your? So, I have a question of: Do you actually just bead for your job, or you teach and you bead, and that's what your job is? It's all the things. So, so you know, you really can't make a living just making and selling beadwork. It's very uh, difficult, and so I'm always trying to create all these little revenue streams to kind of patch together um, most of a, a I don't want to call it a salary, but so I'm doing parties, I'm teaching, I'm making and selling stuff, I do some commissions, um, and I also work off a lot of grants. So um, I will write grants and get funded to do different projects through that. But really, none of it is enough to to make a full living off of. Um, so, so, but I do pretty good. I do a little bit more every year, um, and yeah, it's just kind of a hard business model uh, to do. And so, so, thinking outside the box is really important. Yeah, and you know, I worked a lot of years in education, um, doing all kinds of work i think i did every job at university of washington and, and admin you could um i came out i went to school for a business degree which probably wasn't the greatest fit for me um but you know i just have i just like i don't know i just like trying to come up with ideas and see and just like build a little model out of it and like and i love the bead work because i just i really love doing math and so you know, just trying to figure out like how many kilos of beads do I need to buy to for a class to teach a class. Yeah. I mean, I love that. So, and then when you like when you go to my website and see my Excel spreadsheet about how to calculate the the count for your starting row, I don't know. I just love it. I love that math. I just I love doing what I do. Um, it's just really fun. And so, um, so yeah, I just try to eke by with what I do. Um, my husband kind of if you know if it weren't for him he's my biggest benefactor and he really supports the work i do um but his parents were oh man you know they were really great and i i they're not his he's not native his parents lived in albuquerque and they were really a great inspiration to me sadly i didn't fully realize till after they passed away how much they supported native artists you know they collected art and they collected pottery um but I just didn't fully recognize it until his mother passed away and going through her things, um, like how much of a supporter of native artists she was. And she even supported me too. Like she was, she would always insist on paying me. Like, you know, she would want to buy some things and I'd be like, you're my mother-in-law, I'll just give it to you. And she would always insist on paying me, you know, and it wasn't like a huge sale or anything, but it was, I really didn't fully recognize that now that they're gone um and then i now i really in that in my what i do you know just trying to support native artists in any little way you can you just never know um you know like my little deb my little deb earrings like it's such it's a really tender story but like you know i came back from oklahoma i had done this bending trip there and she saw this color that she wanted in shorter earrings 
And I came back and my um, bookshelf had collapsed in my studio. And God, it was just such a bummer. It was such a huge mess. I did not want to deal with it. It was there for days. And I was just like, I don't want to have to deal with this huge mess. And she texted me and she was like, hey, I really want those earrings. And I was like, if really, I mean, I mean, I don't want to cry or anything. It's late at night and I'm tired, but it really just meant so much that she wanted to support, but like she valued my work enough to like text me from Oklahoma for a little pair of earrings. And so, you know, it's like when you are, um, you know, at a show or supporting an artist, like you just don't know how much just like so buying a pair of earrings means to somebody, you know, that they've made it, that not even just like they're trying to pay their electric bill or like get some gas money home, um, but just kind of to their soul and their psyche, it really just means so much to support um, anybody who's made anything. And so, you know, that's, that's the other message I try to convey when I'm teaching people, especially young people that just, I don't know, it just, it's a really meaningful process to make something and sell it and not like in the capitalistic sort of way, but just like that whole psyche it takes to do that. It really, it's like an act of courage. It really is. And um, so anyway, so that's just where I go late at night. <laughs> really true because you're not vague we know you understand exactly what you're saying <laughs> I've, I've nothing vague there i've done my share of trying to make product and selling it and having the most terrible people coming up to me and saying oh i could buy that at walmart for two dollars and i you know and then you have the people that are just the most amazing people that support you you know and they make you feel like wow like they're like i'll take four collar four dog collars i just make dog stuff <laughs> four dog collars you know, oh, and you know, throw in it, throw in an extra, uh, a little vest. And, and then, you know, I'd like to, you to make the, you know, like that kind of stuff. It's just like, it, it's, it's true. It's like, it makes you feel good because you put so much work into it. Like the artist, the crafter, the seamstress, you know, the crocheter, the knitter, the crafter, um, the artisan, they, they put so much work and heart into it. And, it's really nice when you have someone that says, I'll take four of those and they don't question your prices. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, well, that one that Just charge it up. Well, and I was talking with a good friend of mine and she said her little sister is not really charging enough and just, and it's like, it really does, it is kind of a process to kind of get to that level of confidence to, to, to say, and, and I was saying to her, it's like, I kind of see, it's like, this is what, it, this took me in like three hours. And like, this is what an hour of my time is worth. And so if you don't value my time, like I value my time, then go to Walmart, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I know. So it really <laughs> is, but it's been a real know. journey, I think, just to get to this point. Um, and, and I don't even feel like I'm all the way there yet. Like, it's still really fun. I feel like I still have a long way to go and, and, um, but it's fun. It's like fun talking to you all about this stuff because I don't really ever kind of think it through fully out loud to somebody. So thank you. It is hard to find a good customer. You know, I I, I can recall a time when I had a uh, some knives and some feather work I had. And I had a, Joe was fairly well off, poo-poo the work. And, you know, I had another guy that came in you know, he's like, mm, you know, I want a collection. I only buy from this and this, whatever. And then you had a guy, a family come in and the guy bought a couple of high-end things, but he was kind of really snobbish. And then I had a family come in that was looking at another piece that was barely, you know, not, you know, not moderately priced. It was kind of high-end, but they loved it. The kid loved it. They asked to see it and they're like, well, they're, you know, they look at the price tag going and the husband's like, and the wife, they loved the piece. It was a feather fan I made. And I'm like, no, that piece belongs to them. It doesn't belong to me. And so I kind of knocked him a deal and I, I said, they're like, we can't afford this. I said, I want you to have it. Um, and so I took a, honestly, it was like, you know, a 10 month payment plan from him with the promise they'd sent it, but I just knew about it. But, you know, it, the, the family that's, that appreciates the art so much, I will bend over 
backwards to let them, for them to have that, then a person may be knowledgeable, but you do like that knowledgeable customer. We all have stories like that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what energizes you when you see that. Yeah. Well, I know for them to learn something from it. Well, and like I had a mom that wanted to buy a gourd dance shaker for her mm -hmm. son and I had it for her and I was all ready to like sell it to her. And you know, it's this like old mama, you know, old lady mama. And it, this was at Daybreak Star Pow Wow. It was one of the weird years when I could go because Daybreak Star, um, the Seafair Pow Wow is always the same weekend as Comanche Homecoming. And so I always miss the Daybreak Star Pow Wow because I'm in Oklahoma. But um, but yeah, so they did this. I think he was, I think it was head man dancer. They did this huge giveaway and they were so generous. And and then she was, and then she was like, okay, I'm ready for that that shaker and I was like I felt so bad I was just like you could just have it like you just did all this giveaway like just take it like I'm not gonna charge you anything <laughs> for this <laughs> but yeah there is that thing like going back to my piggy bank and my quarter rolls you know it's just like that our sense of values is so infused in our culture and just like you know it's yeah it's hard to explain sometimes to people I get it sometimes you know you want to you don't want to put so much, you got to put a price tag on stuff. You never get, you're never getting to get your time out of what you make, <clears throat> the money out of what the time you put into a piece. Um, but you know, when you try to put a price tag on there and then, um, whoops, I lost my point. I blinked. <laughs> well, you know, hold here's, on, hold on, hold here's on. okay. Huh? Well, here's a funny story is I, well, I shouldn't, I'm not going to yeah, say. I had such a, like a really good point to make. It was all noble. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Well, I had a piece, I'm going to say what it was in case anybody's watching and though, but I did not want to sell it. I mean, it was something of my personal use mm -hmm. and I was at a show and, or, and they really, really wanted it. And I was like, well, it's not for sale. Like this is mine and I use it. And they're like, but I really, really want it. And so I quote, I gave them this like ridiculous price. I'm just like, nobody would ever pay that much like, for this. Okay. And then they did. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess I'll make me another one, but you know, yeah. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I, I had that happen to me for my beaded eggs. I had, had these beaded eggs that I made and I really didn't want to sell them because of like, you know, seriously, like they, they were the first ones I ever made and I still mm -hmm. use, I was using them as like a sample in the store. So I didn't really want to sell them because then I have to make them again. And those were the first ones I made. And Oh my gosh, the same thing happened. Like, I'm like, yeah, like this egg that was like, it was seriously maybe like two inches high. I'm like, yeah, that's $80. Like, I just like threw out like a really crazy, like, okay. And I'm like, oh, shoot, like, I'm like, oh, I should have it because I don't want to sell it. I want to see a picture of it. Oh, I'll send you a picture. Oh, let yeah, me show send me a picture. picture. I think one of my favorite stories is like, I had another, you know, kind of a dichotomy show is, I got asked to do an art market. It was over in uh, an area toward Los Angeles. I live about 150 miles from Los Angeles, too close to LA, but got asked to do an art market. If there didn't know much about it, went up and the crowd was very much of, uh, of uh, Walmart is fine art. And they watched dance with walls two, three or four times. So they're experts type of crowd. And did that and it was like you're discouraging going i could get this oh i can make you know somebody that looks at the somebody you spend like, like six hours on they're going i go home get the i can go over get stuff like that a hobby lobby and go make it myself you're like yeah go for it buddy <laughs> it's a bit discouraging that you think that there's no more knowledgeable people in the world and then the following weekend i had to go over i got invited to a very short it was only a three-hour powwow it was the native american science and engineering conference that was being held that year over at uh, long beach convention center uh, went and did that show, like it says, just a week later. And I so enjoyed myself working with those students because, uh, you know, they would ask questions. They're like, what's this? What's this mean? It was on Saturday night. I'm getting calls the following Friday from students going, when I bought this, I had some questions and they're asking just really cerebral and they take, you know, taking the time to answer them. God, that so filled my picture back full of energy again <laughs> after the weekend prior. It, that that made me enthusiastic the hope in the art market with the young with the young students there uh that that gave me hope for a long time it tempered wow. the very bad experience the weekend before so i like how that you know the yin and yang got to even itself out there but very much and I, I i i like to picture myself i like to picture you working with students that way with the same thing filling that picture 
Aww. And and helping make knowledgeable audiences that are not, not that you know knowledge is not coming from reading the backs of Leaning Tree cards from Walmart. <laughs> well, and it's fun what I do because it's like any age can do it, and mm -hmm. um, I haven't done so much the video with kids yet. I'm this summer. I have some a little group lined up to see how it works, but. Um, and then with elders, it's really fun. So it just takes you a lot of places too. You know, it gets gets you out of the house. Well, of course, when you can get out of the house, because we still can't go anywhere. <laughs> I know. Yeah. The door open up, and I'm like, I'm not going to contribute to anything. So we're still pretty, pretty, been pretty homebound on my end. And I'm a guy that's just traveling a lot this time of year. So you know the pictures I was showing earlier with the poppies in the background. So this is something I'm working on right now. I'm actually working on a painting. Actually, it's so funny. Yeah. What sure. painting? Is it oils? Yeah, it's oils. Oh, nice. I'm doing a painting of a, of a super bloom. Oh, it looks yeah. like it really has some texture in the stems. Yeah, yeah I do paint. I actually, I don't know if you can see it. Like, I usually put a lot of texture on it. It's hard to see, actually. Oh, nice. So this is actually my study I'm doing of the poppies. Uh -huh. the painting that I'm working on now that you're my friend on Facebook um <laughs> I actually I need to start working on it but I have I'm gonna put these big poppies on the front of on the foreground of my painting but yeah I went to school for fine arts and I studied painting oh wow that's so cool I've been watching your work on that over the last several weeks and it's it's like I've and I I never really tried to sell my painting so I was the reason why I was going to say that is because when I was when I was in college, I really wanted to sell paintings. That was what I wanted to do for my profession, and I love I love I've been painting my whole life. I've been painting since I was seven years old, and I quickly realized when I made started making the dog collars and all the dog outfits and stuff. I realized it, I didn't want to lose that passion that I had for painting, and so I just did not try to sell my paintings just because it's so it's it's, it's so involved and so personal. And when I was fresh out of college, I was so afraid to go to the galleries and say, you know what, this is the painting I have, and this is worth this much money. This is how much I want to sell it for. And I had, didn't have that confidence in myself, like what you were talking about undervaluing yourself. I didn't have that confidence in myself to say, you know, I, 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 I need to sell it for this amount, you know, and I was so afraid. And so I think that what you're saying about, you know, being experienced as a beater and then getting a chance to start selling more and more, you feel more comfortable with what you feel like you can sell things for. And you get that confidence to say, I want this much for this project. I want this much for this project. And that's, that only comes with experience of selling things. Well, so. and I will say I didn't really get here on my own. I have so much support through um, different organizations. It is great. Seattle's a great place to be an artist. There's just a lot of resources here. Um, I did some training through the Artist Trust and uh, the Yahoo show. Really, I feel like, I mean, it was only just a year ago, but I feel like that really kind of propelled me forward a lot with the um, just being in a, a all indigenous show it was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but then First Peoples Fund, um, has been doing some online trainings. And so they actually fund my, I, five years ago, I got the um, artist, let's see, I gotta get the name right. Uh, business development. I, it's, I can't remember the name of it fully, but it was a business development grant I applied for and it funded getting business cards and my website and just kind of some business startup stuff that is nice to have, um, but it's always, you kind of think like, I'm not gonna spend money on a website. That's, you know, it's just like too expensive. Um, but then they also did a training in um, Santa Fe for a weekend and that was really good. But now the trainings they've been doing online, I think are even better than going there and having the in-person training because you're getting everything like in a weekend. 
and they've been doing things once a week for several weeks and they're just really good. And just to have something that's indigenous focused. And so like having had my whole education, you know, just in a Western colonized style, like getting information that's kind of really aligned more with my values. I mean, it's just astounding. And it just makes me a little sad that, um, that I didn't really get this more before. And so um, just look up First People's Fund, follow them on Facebook, um, and you can get those, just start going to the trainings and you can like your show too. You can go back and watch the ones, but like they did one on social media marketing and they did one last weekend with um, Ben Sherman that talked about value, the value of values, which was just a nice uh, message to hear. Um, but they're just really useful. I really... I really like them. And so that the First People's Fund has helped. The Small Business Administration helped a little bit with my other business that failed with my hair, air hand invention yeah. thing, <laughs> which was also a really fun ride and learned a lot from that. But, um, and then the Potlatch Fund here in Seattle, they're a local um, granting, grant making organization. And then the Evergreen State College Longhouse they do a lot of educational stuff. And so they're getting ready to roll out some videos from all artists from all over. And so I'm, I got funded to submit my video, um, just like how to do the little bead, bead, how to do this. Cause I did a version of this that's on my uh, YouTube, but it's pretty janky. And people said I go too fast and I do, I do it in like 15 minutes. And it really takes like a full hour <laughs> to do. Yeah. So, um, but so, you know, I guess if I'm going to give some late night, midnight advice, you know, just like if wherever you are, go look for some resources, go to the library, check out a book, you know, on how to start a business or go, uh, well, I guess we can't go. We, our libraries are still closed, man. <sighs> They're just yeah. really, I love my no, library. There's... What's what's interesting about this whole quarantine thing and all this, everyone has to stay home. There's been so much information that's being put out that wasn't out before that people are sharing. Like, you know, all these restaurants are sharing recipes they have. Mm -hmm. And like all these schools are doing like free, you know, tell, free classes <laughs> and all kinds of interesting stuff is absolutely out there if you're looking for it. It's so, true. And it's just like right now, especially right now, everyone is trying to share all kinds of information with each other. So this is a great time, you know, if you're home. You know, it really is. And, and I always tell, and I don't know if this is bad. I'm a, I was a college academic advisor in one of my jobs. So I shouldn't really tell people this, but like I spent a lot of time and tears and money and sweat, everything, getting a business degree at, you know, at, I don't, I won't say, it, but you know, it's like, it was a good education. And I'm sure for like business people, it was really good. But um, what I've learned in the past few years, going to the small business administration and startup events around Seattle, like I have learned so much, it's been a great education. And so, especially now that like people may not want to be going back to university campuses, like you, there's just so many ways you can really learn on your own and just get out there and get in a community. Um, but I will say a university degree is quite valuable in a lot of ways. And so I don't want to dismiss that you don't want to do that. Um, but even not a university degree, any kind of degree, uh, trade degree, like any type of education is great. I love, I love, I worked at a community college too. Um, and I loved all the programs we have. Um, like I, so here in Seattle, like all the fish and everything, like just right over there is the maritime center. So you can go to community college and get a maritime degree. Like I'm from Oklahoma and that like totally blows my mind. Cause like, we, like, you know, like we don't have, we just have some lakes. Like we don't really have the ocean or anything. And so like yeah. that you can go get a maritime degree, I think is so cool. <laughs> Well, it's also, the thing is, um, with education and, you know, it can be any level of education, but I think the one thing that I took from university was that, um, just being around a lot of different people and, mm -hmm. you know, meeting a lot of people and learning a lot from other people, you know, it's, it was, it was being in the experience of being away from home, mm -hmm. um, 
experience of learning things different than maybe I wouldn't have. I mean, I took astronomy in college, which was really cool. And I never would have thought of taking that. Um, and I learned a lot from it. And it's like, it just, you know, it's just, it's like what you're saying, you know, you learn different things. It just opens your eyes and opens your self as a better, more rounded person. Um, and it can be anything. It can be like watching all the different YouTube videos on all kinds of different things that inspire you. It can be taking classes with lots of different people like artists, speed workers, anything, taking community class, community college classes and learning, getting an AA degree and whatnot. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. It just, it broadens your horizons. It makes you a better person to, you know. Constantly. Even on the pragmatic level is getting, you know, getting a college degree um, to have something for a full-time job because let's just say it, being a full-time, being a full-time artist, it does not make you rich 99.99999% of the time. No. It's crap pay. <laughs> I mean, people on welfare, if I was on welfare, I'd be going, look, I've got this windfall of money. I mean, it's that bad but you get my point on that one is it does not leave a fallback but it leaves a base for things like insurance coverage and whatnot because the IA clinics a lot of them aren't that, ain't that great um but it is something to have on there to do that because uh, not a lot of people can make it doing full-time artist you know being a full-time artist it is very difficult it's all I've done since I was 16 and you know there's good years bad years it's a lot almost like farming which is something I think before we go I would like to touch on the subject if this is cool, of learning from one's failure to be an artist. Because usually you talk about this succeed, this help here. You know, what does a person learn from and what can be taken away from their failures as try as like selling, developing their own style, their own signature with their artwork rather than copying, you know, not copying somebody, but not being as uh, intuitive in their views of the work, I think one way to say it is something if anybody wants to pipe in on that part. Well, I was going to say something and I totally lost it. <laughs> you did a me. You did a me, Savannah. <laughs> no. Well, I will, I'll say something on that, that I shared this story. So um, we have Seattle Sounders here. They're our soccer team. And the, um, the goalie is also an artist. And he talks about the reason why he does art is because it gives him a place in his life where he can fail. Because if you're the goalie, like you can't get it wrong. Like you have to get it right every single time. And so um, as kind of stress relief and well-balanced life, he does art um, to, to kind of balance that out. So I love, I love that story from him. Um, and his art's amazing. And like, I'm, it's, it's midnight. I can't remember our goalies. <laughs> Stephen Fry. Why do you think I've been eating M&Ms and Cracker Jacks and Pepsi? I'm Stephen probably not going to fall back. Fry is our goalie. <laughs> yeah, I probably should actually be eating something because I keep feeling like I'm yawning, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to drink water. No, I don't have Why do you any think I've come with the smorgasbord I brought to Quarantino's here? I think it's funny that you say that with the artist is like what you know stylized as a place to make mistakes. Um, a good metaphor for that, just on my end, is that like whenever I paint feathers, I'll paint designs along the quills or sometimes along the whole feather. And I don't put like a base pale layer of paint so it can have that. I let you laughing at girl. I was laughing because I started yawning. I'm not bored with you. I'm just <laughs> now I'm gonna yawn. <laughs> or it's gonna spread, spread the love, spread the love. Anyway, I'll paint a feather and the more stylized it is and kind of just not incongruous, but the more stylized the feather is, the more I screwed up on it. Mm -hmm. So while it's a feather, I'll just add a little bit more angle here and a little shading there and I screwed up, let's do it some more. So, you know, when you start on one thing, it sure isn't what you pictured in your mind when you started, rarely is it, is it? But yeah, you know, somebody will look at it and go, that's kind of a different departure for you. Why did you do it that way? I went, while I was painting this part, I sneezed and spread the paint. So I went, well, let's change that a bit. <laughs> well, I think that one thing metaphor. that I noticed about like success and failures here, like working with my mom here at Dancing Bear, um, I've always thought, I've always been trying to think outside the box and trying to think of ways to help our business, my family business succeed. And um, so we've always, I've always been trying all kinds of different things. And sometimes they don't work. And sometimes they work, you know, and the thing is, it's like, this 
keep trying, keep trying, keep trying to do different things and keep like, if you dream it, try it. Why not? You know, it depends on, it depends on your measure of success too. So one artist might say, uh, well, I'm not, I've been doing this for five years. I'm not rich and I can't, I don't have a big old truck and I'm not, my name's not in big old neon lights. And my response is, were you able to pay the rent this month? <laughs> then you've been successful so far. <laughs> Yeah, you know, a lot of the artists that um, when I was talking to um, when I was talking to my professor in, co in college, he was he's an artist and he was taking a job as being an instructor. And he had said that, you know, sometimes what's interesting is if you really, truly rely on your art as your income, things happen for you where things jobs will come, things will come and you'll be able to pay that bill. It's the weirdest thing. And if you just keep at it sometimes, and that's interesting that that's how the universe works, that, you know, someone is like tr really trying to make it their way with fine arts or arts, and they just continually, things just keep happening for them. They keep, they get more work, more work. As they finish one, something else comes up. As they finish one, another thing, and another thing. That's I've been a long time, and I finally made King a taco stand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, but it takes time to get that confidence. Like, um, I actually feel like I'm ready myself. Like I've been painting forever in my life and I took some time off. I didn't paint for many years, but I'm actually considering trying to um, put together a portfolio and actually approaching a gallery to sell. Nice. I don't, I don't, I haven't thought about that for many years and it's never been something I've thought about. So it's, um, I know that green keeps trying to attack you. It's like a little alien blob or something. No, it's an aurora borealis. Like I'm knocking back away. <laughs> Don't you see it next to you? We're all in the same cafe. <laughs> and the fan is slightly blowing and bending the fabric and making green glows. He's speaking like a British slash Scottish slash French slash Monty Python right now. Just so you know. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> anyway seriously this guy is like so much fun to work with like we've been having so much fun the whole time we've been doing this whole show with him seriously he doesn't know <laughs> i say i say i agree with you <laughs> it looks like There's from this angle it's white slightly mismatched the on from his computer monitor <laughs> i'm not um, going to do that to you know. oh my gosh how's that that looks actually more natural Yes, it does. It looks and it looks almost like, straight. Just like <laughs> marks. Seriously, you just do like a big old. I'll take four dollars and tell and I'll take us. I forget the line from Groucho Marx. I'll high. take two of these and I draw Martini. <laughs> <laughs> as long as the mustache is not cut here, that would be bad. Yeah, just a little bit. But yeah, so I think that on that note. I think, are we ready to end our evening? This went a lot later. This was almost like a two hour show. Wow, it was hold such on, a great on. conversation. Doing there, really... doing there, doing there. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> it's like, whack. It was such a oh, good wow. I really appreciate you inviting me to be on the show. And I love hearing about your art. I can't wait to see where that's going. Yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, it's you know, I'm going to be pinging you offline and like needling. Yeah. And being yeah. like, well, I won't say needling you because I just did this five day focus challenge. I, today was the last day and they talked about your accountability partner that if you set a goal, you're more likely to reach it if you have an accountability partner. So if that's your goal, I'll be your accountability partner to be like, uh -oh. <laughs> like check in and be like, you know, Hey, where are you, where are you at with that? Okay, well, <laughs> show you. I have my, actually, I have my easel right here. Uh, I have to it's invisible. <laughs> Everything's invisible. Billy <laughs> partner, I like that term. It's a little more better than somebody asking, asking somebody to kick your, kick your butt. Fully, it's fully disappearing. So I'll show it to you right after. Well, and that's what this. No, turn, off, turn, off, turn off your virtual background. Just turn off your virtual background. Well, then people are going to see the scary in the background. You're to lose the magic. True enough. So, so James, this is the woman that did the um, five day focus challenge. She calls mm. herself a professional butt kicker. <laughs> well, she knows how to speak my version of English. <laughs> oh, oh, that's 
that's nice. You should take a picture of that and have that be your virtual background. That's beautiful. This one, actually, my style of painting, I don't know if you can see it. It's very, um, I paint with a lot of paint. So this is very uh -huh. textural here. Yeah. It's pretty textural. Like this sky is like so textural. Oh, but I would love that. When I um, was in college, I real I started painting with oils. I painted with acrylic before. And um, basically what happens, I've always been really inspired by Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. And um, so I kind of, I kind of, I guess I'm kind of, if I was to categorize myself, James is being a little, he's being a I'm trying to get rid of my ear. <laughs> You're trying to what? I'm trying to do like the, you have the ear disappear going, eh, you said Van Gogh. Actually, it wasn't his ear, by the way, it was his ear lobe. <laughs> I'm going to stick with my, uh, the, the urban legend, not the real legend. So, so Svea, we have, okay, so I, in Seattle, I live in Ballard. It's, um, it's a little neighborhood that was founded, or not founded, because there were native people here already, but it was uh, invaded by Norwegians. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of Norwegian, Scandinavian, what are all the, uh, Icelandic, Swedish. Scandinavians. Uh, all the all the Scandinavians here. But anyway, they, they have a, a really cool little museum here and they had a show from, oh, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? L.A. Ring. He is, what was he, Danish? I'm not sure if he was Danish or Norwegian, but he had the most amazing painting. And I went to go see it every chance I could because I can walk to the museum from my house. And it was that really thick painting it was called the rye fields and it was little I mean it was like maybe like this big. But it was just rye fields and it was so thick brush strokes and then his signature was scratched into the paint. It wasn't mm -hmm. signed it was scratched yeah. into the paint, but then you could like stand here and look at it and like every angle you look at it, it would change and be different. Oh my God, it was so amazing. They had alarms on all the paintings because they were so valuable. They had never left the country before. And so I couldn't steal it because <laughs> I might have if I thought I could get away with it. Because well, good know. thing we're nobody's going to know that right now on the show. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I'm like the painting went missing, and guess what? Cynthia was talking about it on on, <laughs> on a live broadcast. Oh, but it was an amazing. It was an actually a really amazing show because this guy, no, like you never heard of this guy, and he had just had some amazing work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's, there's um, it's just you know, for me, like I've always been. That's the painting style I've almost always painted. And it's just been natural to me. So like, I guess I'm an impressionist, abstract, um, abstract, abstract, impressionist artist that, um, you know, and I've, and this is like the first landscape painting really I've done since like high school. So it's not really something I do either, the landscapes, like I do more like abstractions. So this is really a departure from what I do. That's why I'm doing this kind of thing where I'm just practicing making um, poppies because that really does. I mean, even I know we don't have the greatest cameras, but I can, it does really kind of pop. You can kind of see the yeah. textures coming out. Yeah, like the texture here, like so in that painting that I'm doing, like I want, I have another board I have to practice because I've been so busy with just getting our store back together and the whole mask thing and all this like craziness. But um, <laughs> with with that like i'm i'm practicing so that when i work on my big painting i actually kind of know what i'm doing because like i said i'm not a landscape artist really mm -hmm. i'm very much an abstraction artist so um this is like a totally different thing for me and i just figured i wanted i have and i've been wanting to do this painting for like about two years now so it's like it it started to be made I guess. That's exciting. So did you start it after quarantine started? Uh, yes. Man, I think it's really interesting how like the creative, like so much creativity came out of that. Mm -hmm. Let's put it this way. Out of necessity for something for stimulus. Savea, how much are you venturing into your, uh, out of your comfort zone? Oh, for the painting? Yeah. Um, well, I did a Van Gogh um, study of Starry Night about three years ago, 
that was my first Van Gogh study that I've done where it was actually his like actual painting. Yeah. Um, and that study, um, it, it has a lot of similarities, I guess, in the sky in regards to just like painting this texture of the sky no, and painting. How much have you stepped out of your comfort zone? Because you may be used to doing, oh, all of a sudden you switch positions. <laughs> oh, well. It looks like you mirrored, it looks like you mirrored your camera. How much? You, usually people like to stick within a certain area, a certain style. They don't really grow yeah. on this one. How much have you had to step outside of your zone, your step out of what you normally do on this one to grow with your paintings well, recently on this one? I'm basing it on several photos that I've found from the Super Bloom. So yeah. it's just, yeah. it's based on so many photos when I just paint out of my mind. Okay. No like has, but, okay. I paint on abstractions, entirely abstractions. So for me to actually base my painting on a whole bunch of photos, I have never, I haven't done that in a okay. long okay. time. Okay. And then painting flowers. I don't paint flowers. I just don't. So this is really hard for me because it's, it's something I don't normally do. So that's why I was saying like, this has been very challenging. And that's why I wanted to do it because it's something I haven't done really ever. Mm -hmm. so. It's a, uh... It is a challenge for some individuals because you are really putting yourself out there to be criticized, judged yep. by people out there. Usually they want to, you know, you know, so many people have such great potential, great artwork, but they're like, yeah. I'm not putting it out there. They're nervous, you know, and it, yeah, it, uh, it's hard. It's hard. It is. You, you really got to put you out there and you're going to have people that like it. So you'll, you know, you get somebody that comes along and says, that's fantastic. I love your, I love it. And they're just going great. And you can have another guy come over and look at it and go, meh, and walk on. It's just, <laughs> yeah. you got to be ready for, it's, yeah. everybody's got an opinion. Yeah. And, I think and the artwork is very much it's subjective. Yeah. It's just, it's the people just don't have, they just, yeah. yeah. There's okay. high art pieces, some galleries I've been in, I'll see the hard art piece going, mm, okay. And, and there's others I go, wow. And you know, the same with people with my art. Yes, it is. They don't like my stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's academic stick figures and there's non-academic stick figures. <laughs> good, very good. Yes, all right. So on that note, let's end the show. Did it, uh, I stayed awake. I didn't know I could stay awake this late. <laughs> <laughs> you've, done, you've done awesome this has been very cool dance, we always like to dance at the end of the show to okay. the credit. all right okay. let me get it queued up and uh, oh, I gotta stand up. if i'm gonna dance i gotta stand up here we go with the closer all right everybody we'll see you next week been awesome yay and closer now Over yet? Over.